pleasure to introduce to you Professor Emil Voest. Emil is a professor of medical oncology and serves as a medical director on the executive board of the Netherlands Cancer Institute in Amsterdam. That is the institute where you are right now. In daily practice, however, this actually means that Emil is a medical oncologist who treats patients and he is a translational scientist. His translational research has focused on improving systemic treatment for patients with cancer and this includes the clinical development of targeted agents, discovery and validation of biomarkers with emphasis on genetics and tumor organoids and identification of new targets of treatment to overcome chemo resistance. There's a lot more to say about Emil and his biosketch and you can find it on Lanyard. So actually it's all posted there. So what I would like to mention specifically is two projects that he is involved in. Uh, first, he serves as one of the dream team leaders in the Stand Up to Cancer International Translational Research Grant named Prospective Use of DNA Guided Personalized Cancer Treatment. And the second project is more nationally oriented, where he serves on the board of the Center for Personalized Cancer Treatment. So that's a national program involving academic cancer centers and teaching hospitals. So I think if anyone in this room actually needs a reminder why research IT tools such as Transmart are actually desperately needed and to what scale and to what size it should grow to accommodate great translational research studies. Please listen to the work of Emil Voest and the work is entitled uh, oh, challenges and opportunities in precision medicine. Emil, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm a bit scared uh, because you're nice and this is scheduled as a keynote for one hour and you have more or less of a, an IT background and I'm a clinician. So um, I hope to get you interested and keep that interest all the time throughout my talk. Uh, and what I would like to do with you is to give my perspectives on things and, and what I'm facing on a daily basis as a challenge on how to advance personalized medicine. So, um, then this should work. Here we go. So there are a couple of things uh, that, that I would like to discuss with you over the, the next 45 minutes. Um, why we're all doing this. Um, so there are definitely opportunities there for better care. There are opportunities to get more mileage out of already existing drugs that are out there that have a, a lot of knowledge in them but we're using them not in the most appropriate way. And obviously healthcare costs are an important issue as well. But there are also various challenges and you've been discussing that over this meeting uh, on numerous times and uh, data sharing, the privacy, uh, upfront costs that we need to do, invest in, in initiatives like this to kind of move forward to make sure that the opportunities are, are actually uh, taken. So this is, um, this is what we're trying to do. Um, this is how we treat patients now. We divide them up, colon cancer, breast cancer, whatever type of cancer we give based on evidence-based medicine, we do the trials, 500 arm A, 500 arm B, we look which groups live longest and then we say this is going to be the standard treatment. But in real life, when I'm facing a patient, I have to discuss this. This patient asks me and says, okay, um, what are my chances? And I say, well, you have either it works to a certain percentage, it doesn't work at a certain percentage or it remains the same at a certain percentage. But for the individual patients it still is very difficult to follow and if I were a patient I would feel the same. So ideally obviously uh, we need to kind of work out a system that we can say if we collect all this information we need to identify which patients will benefit and then in the end I have just a simple question or the simple task to inform the patient about that it always works but there are certain side effects that you may take into account whether you want to undergo the treatment or not. And, um, and the right panel is definitely not where we are now. We're still in the left panel, although, and I'll show you in a bit, uh, there are some tremendous successes already made in, uh, in, in medical oncology. 
Also, given um, the fact that we know more and more and more about tumors and, and the DNA sequencing technologies that are around, uh, we know that there are uh, tumors that are heterogeneous. We know that the percentage of patients that can benefit from a certain treatment based on DNA is rapidly increasing. You see the numbers here on the left panel. Uh, melanoma, thyroid, the, the, this is the percentage of patients that, that has a genetic target that may be used for a particular treatment. And uh, in the end, we expect that this number will increase, uh, given the fact that we're going to sequence more and more and um, data will be coming out of these studies. We also have the hypermutated genes from the, uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas, which also tells you that the level of complexity is enormous. It's uh, very naive to think that just a single gene will give you all the answers and know how to treat your patient. So that we're beyond that stage. So that's the, 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 all the, um, the interest in DNA sequencing. And then the question remains, what has it delivered us so far? And I'm, I'm, I've just compiled a, a few examples here. Uh, a number of exciting drugs are two uh, amplified trastuzumab for BRAF uh, uh, inhibition, EGFR inhibition, ELK, um, and immunotherapy. And uh, I can just show you a couple of these um, uh, survival curves. I can imagine that you're not looking at survival curves on a daily basis. Um, but this is breast cancer, one of the oldest drugs published already in 2001, where you can see that there was a, a great advantage for adding a drug that would only work in 20% of the breast cancer patients to the regimen of the existing chemotherapy. The fact that we only do that in 20% of the patients was, was kind of the start of targeted therapy and individualizing therapy. Because if you would have done this trial in breast cancer in general, the drug would go into the trash can and you would not have an effective treatment that now saves millions of wives, uh, lives um, in women with breast cancer. So that's a very uh, big one. Um, more recently, the BRAF mutated uh, melanoma had a very bad reputation in general. If you had metastatic melanoma in six months, you would be dead. Uh, there was a horrendous disease. And the, um, first now with the BRAF mutation, um, you see if you have then a specific drug for that, you extend the lifespan enormously. And here in overall survival. For those of you who don't have cancer and look at those survival curves, you could say, well, that's fairly disappointing because still in the end everybody dies, so, that, so what are you talking about? But to give this, these patients the opportunity to live significantly longer is for patients with cancer an enormous step forward in, in their uh, lives. And um, it also adds up if you do continuous improvement of your treatment. And I'll, I'll finish with the nivolumab uh, slide. Erlotinib, EGFR inhibition, uh, in l uh, lung cancer. Uh, again, this is a trial, if you would do that unselected, not based on the mutation in the, in the particular receptor, this trial would have failed. Uh, and again, in the early development of each of our inhibitors, they done that trials, each arm, 1,000 patients, and there were superimposable survival curves. And now if we now look at the particular uh, individual targets, we identify patients, and then you can see that there is a huge step forward um, Crisotinib, um, this is an extremely effective drug, only in a very small percentage of patients. And the interesting part here is you get a, a kind of a plateau that um, gives a long-term benefit. And we have patients that came in, started on crisotinib based on their uh, genetic mutation, and are now three years out and, and have a great life, uh, can work, um, tolerate the drug very well, and we would have not been able to treat those patients if we have done the trials on an unselected way. Then you could argue, okay, why is the overall survival here superimposable? Again, you have to realize that this drug was so tremendously effective that any patient that would cross over to the other line would have the same benefit. So you have to kind of look at those curves in, in that way. And then the final one, um, this is nivolumab immunotherapy which uh, we feel that generally you work, you respond better to an immunotherapeutic if you have more mutated genes. So you have more uh, new antigens that can be expressed and the drug will be more effective. And the interesting part here, if you look at melanoma, for instance, you see that there is a now a, a plateau which is unprecedented. 
just keep in mind that I told you about the six, seven months uh, average lifespan. We're now expanding that to years. So this is, these are not the very small incremental benefits that we have in these patients. These are a huge step forward. But again, and I'll come back to that, it's not for every patient and we need to identify those patients um, that benefit because the drugs are also very expensive. Okay, that's overall. We have identified some of these genetic aberrations and we have seen that based on the larger uh, data sets. Um, another example is that we have the exceptional responder program that, that is actually wor worldwide where we have patients that are responding to a particular drug exceptionally well, unprecedented well. And if you then zoom in and you like try to understand why that patient has responded exceptionally well, you may come up with, with really good clues on how to proceed and how to further develop the drug. So what you see here uh, is, a, is a PET scan of a, a, a woman with breast cancer, ER, PR positive, HER2 negative. Um, and you can see on the, on the PET scan that there are metastases all over. And this patient was enrolled in a trial where um, the patient was treated with neurotinib, which is a, a, a pan-HER uh, inhibitor, which would generally not be the first idea to give that to a HER2 negative patient. But what you see here is that there was a tremendous response in this patient. So the, the, the lesions already after eight weeks were diminished and this prolonged, this was a prolonged effect um, and the interesting part is then if you then zoom in on the genetics, you'll find this ERI2 uh, V777L um, mutation. So this is extremely helpful. This is not anecdotal. This is not just something for academia. This means that we now have a patient with an identifiable target. We have a drug and now it's a matter of finding that patient in all the other patients that are coming along in hospitals. And that is not an easy task. Uh, in the Netherlands, and I consider our healthcare system to be really good, um, we still miss patients with lung cancer that have the ELK or the EGFR inhibition uh, uh, mutations. Uh, and, and I think we would miss them in 20 to 30 percent of the cases, either by not doing the diagnostics properly or not having the right input or not having the knowledge. So there are a number of reasons. But this is extremely important because that, that is actually the future of what I foresee as personalized medicine is going try to identify those patients. And then just to give you a, a simple example, I've, I've been running a phase one program um, and what you usually see if you have these new drugs coming along is that you start off with the phase one, the, the drug has a great background scientifically, it works in mice uh, and then you start treating the patient and, and I, I just the general concept is that the first patient that goes in the trial usually has a really good response and then you think, well, this is going to be major. And then the 20 patients thereafter, what you feel are more or less the same patients, they have no response whatsoever, and then you end up with the conclusion that this drug is not effective. And um, these are just uh, uh, two examples from my personal experience. Patient with multiple lung meds, so these white things there in the lungs, and you can see that they disappeared after treatment with a targeted agent. Here, a liver med. Uh, of a sarcoma patient disappeared after treatment with an mTOR inhibitor. So we see those examples in daily practice. And now we also know that only 7% of all the drugs that are developed are actually reaching market authorization. So that means that we're losing along the way, we're losing a number of drugs that we either don't know how to use properly or we, we don't give them enough chance to kind of be developed any further. So that's also a, a, a challenge and I think it's also a great opportunity um, because if you look at the era of personalized medicine and for instance if I take uh, the US as an example then what you see is that in the US 20 to 40 percent of the patients are treated with off-label use. So the idea of doctors that want to do a little bit more for their patients based on something of a genetics or, or something else um, and they said let's try this, that by itself is a very good a very good attitude I would say and the patients appreciate that very much. The problem here is that if you use 20 to 40 percent of those drugs off-label that means that every doctor in the US or worldwide will make the same mistake all over again because there is no way that these data are collected or, or uh, assembled in a way. 
So that's going to be an um, uh, important uh, issue to keep in mind. Um, the other one is that there are many examples of drugs that have a beautiful target. It works like a charm. And in the end, the drug works totally different than expected. So we need to kind of make sure that we have a, a wide angle view that we give drugs truly an opportunity because it takes a long period of time and a lot of investment to make sure that these drugs are entering patients. So we need to be open to different pathways. We simply don't know a lot of things. And then uh, in the end, the uh, European Medicines Agency, the EMA, uh, in their roadmap to 2015 said we need to kind of develop drugs for uh, areas of unmet medical needs. When they wrote down this, uh, they did not realize that cancer was going to be an area of unmet need and orphan diseases because that's where we're heading. We're heading now to patient subpopulations of less than 1% of the colorectal cancer has this, 1% of the breast cancer patient has that. So we're all creating little orphan diseases and that is something that is going to be a reality and, and we need to face that. Um, it also has an, um, an, a serious impact on trials and concepts where we just had the randomized clinical trials, the phase three study, we built the statistics based on the percentage of outcome that we want to have as an improved uh, uh, treatment. Um, so we're now moving to new trials and designs and, and we, we talk now about umbrella and basket trials. So where the umbrella trial has different drugs um, in a single tumor type. We also have the, um, uh, the basket trials where you have multiple um, um, tumor types and a variety of, of genetic aberrations and try to lump that. And by itself, again, that's a great way forward, uh, but you need to kind of make sure that the signal of activity remains to be defined. And one of the first trials, and it was just published uh, a few weeks ago in Lancet Oncology, one of the first trials to address it was the SHIVA trial. And the investigators um, said, okay, let's do this trial. We, we simply buy drugs from the companies. And then if we have genetic aberrations, we just give patients a drug that makes sense. And let's see what happens there. So you can see that there was a, a, a huge in, uh, amount of of uh, amplifications, activated mutations, inactivation. So th this was the whole spectrum of genetic abnormalities that of the patients that were included. Um, and then they also showed the survival curve. Uh, and you can see you don't need to be very um, an expert in survival curves. This is not really uh, that much difference. It was not significantly different. So there were people are saying, well, um, personalized medicine doesn't work because we simply give a drug and it doesn't matter whether you have a chimpanzee let have to select a drug for your patient or you do that on a DNA sequence analysis. Apparently it doesn't, it doesn't matter that much. I would say this trial has to be done because it was designed already a number of years ago but it also tells you that there is much to learn and that we would not design the trial in a way like this simply because we now know that the context is really important. And just as a simple explanation, this is a patient group with a BRAF mutated melanoma and you have a BRAF inhibitor and you had somewhere around 70-80% response rate. That means the tumor shrinks more than half its size due to a BRAF inhibitor. If you give the same drug to patients with colorectal cancer with the same mutation, you only get 5%. And I can give you a whole biological expose of the work of Rene Bernards here in the NKI about how that works, switching on uh, alternative pathways, receptor, and that it, it means that the context where the tumor has developed was a very important one. It also means that you cannot lump um, data together and then look at the survival curve. We simply have not the knowledge to do that. Okay, so how are we going to proceed with that? Um, hopefully in um, the first uh, um, quarter of next year we will uh, initiate this trial, the drug rediscovery protocol, where we will use off-label drugs in a very well established and, and controlled uh, fashion. We have now five companies signing up, we have 13 drugs that we can use and then we're looking at patients with molecular aberration. We have a molecular tumor board that then looks at the data and says, okay, this may fit with this or that. Identify a potential target, include in the study, and then we take a biopsy at the start, perform whole genome sequencing, collect the clinical data, 
and then uh, and so on and so on. That is how we're going to proceed, and where we uh, and, and on the next slide it, it shows you that we're going to do a similar trial in the U.S. It's called the Taper trial together with ESCO. Uh, Rich Hilsky is the PI, and we came up with the same idea and said let's let's do this trial in such a way that we can at least share the data based on the profiles that we have selected. And, and the drugs are more or less uh, similar. I think there's about an 80% overlap in the drugs. So this is how we're going to do that on two sides of the pond. You also have to realize that it's not that we can find a mutation or an actionable mutation for every patient. Um, there, still, the majority of patients do not have any targetable or actionable mutation. Uh, it's also important to realize that we're now doing panels, small panels. Um, of, of um, DNA diagnostics, which will only give you the things that you already know, the BRAF, the KRAS. But I think we need to kind of broaden our view a little bit and, and do a little bit broader and to, to find more mutations that may give leads to biological activity. Um, and this is, this is how we, we think we should do. Um, first, inclusion criteria, advanced solid tumors, metastatic uh, disease because then you can measure something. It needs to harbor a potentially actual molecular variant, measurable disease, you need to take, be able to take a biopsy, and obviously you need to have acceptable organ function and performance status. And then we say, okay, we use a, a kind of a two-step design. We do eight patients. If we see a response, we add 16 patients, uh, and if we have more than five responses, we'll be in touch with the company and say, okay, let's perform a larger scale study that will allow a route to reimbursement uh, strategies and stuff like that. So this is just a study to pick up early signs of activity. It also means that we can be fairly liberal in what we define as an identifiable or an actionable mutation. It could be something in a pathway, at, at, um, any type of approach that we can say, okay, let's do this basket tumor type because that's important. It is be defined as within a tumor type, a particular genetic aberration, and then see how that, that acts. And then if it works, it's okay, we move on. If we fail to see any activity, we put it out on the board and for everyone to see it, to avoid that all the people are using these drugs off-label will make the same mistake all over again. Um, but there are also definitely uh, some challenges because what is a potentially actionable variant? Uh, um, we need to kind of make use of a knowledge library, we need to make use of cell lines, of uh, PDX models, uh, anecdotal case reports, uh, etc., etc. Um, so that needs to be a one way of, of streamlining that. And then obviously the drug selection um, where we have um, the, the tumor board as, as an important uh, system to identify signs of activity because we focus on the response rate. But in the end, if patients are um, living very long while they were treated, that also should, could be a sign of activity. It's very difficult to define that in a protocol as such. And this is... Um, oops. And again, I, I mentioned that this is a collaborative effort with uh, ESCO. Uh, in the Netherlands, we are now starting to whole genome sequence more than 7,000 patients with metastatic cancer. So that will be an enormous pool of information and also of profiles that we can use for this particular study. Um, and it creates a platform that new drugs that come into the market may also kind of make use of, um, whether it's a compassionate use program or whether it's something that pre-market authorization, you can kind of generate data that will, um, will allow a better selection of patients. And I'll come back to that uh, in a bit. So then I, I switch gear a little bit. Because it's all, um, my world trying to improve um, what we can do for our patients. Um, but I mentioned uh, just quickly that, that we're moving towards more orphan diseases. And, and this is a slide where you can see that there are a number of genes that are in more than 5% of the patients mutated. But you can see that the majority, the majority has frequencies occurring at a very, very low level. And I would say the take home message of this particular slide is no single institution is likely to, to have enough data to make informed clinical decisions. And I would say that is extremely important. Uh, but I don't have to convince you that data sharing is, is the solution uh, I can imagine. 
Um, just a quick reminder before I show some examples of how naive we were on the clinical side in, in, in working with these data. Uh, public databases are obviously very important, but it's always important to realize that if you look at the genetic aberrations and the frequency of occurrence and etc., is that, that these databases have high, generally high volume disease. It's very difficult to transmit tissue of a very small tumor. So what you see is usually underrepresentation of, for, for instance, the very small breast cancers or, or other tumor types. They're generally also primary cancers, and we know that there is a definite selection if you go to the metastatic disease. You have a different genetic makeup, so it may diff tell you a different story. Um, and the clinical follow-up, obviously, is, is um, uh, key in this, and we need to collect that information. And in these databases, they're generally not uh, present in an, in an abundant way. So then, two examples of how naive, um, let me see how naive I was. Uh, th these are our personal experiences. Um, this is a slide from, from the project that we're doing for Stand Up to Cancer. And we said, okay, let's, let's look at this in a smart way. Uh, we use the iSPY trial, which is a breast cancer study, where we have a control arm and we have a arm where we treat um, with a, the EGFR inhibitor and ratinib. <laughs> We have 130 tumor normal pairs from this trial, uh, 78 from the nematinib, 53 from the control arm. We knew what the target was, uh, we knew what the pathway was, and we said, okay, let's now see whether we are, as a primary objective, test this mutation and see if we can qualify a bar biomarker for predicting complete pathological response. And then you have the obvious pathway that we all know that are involved in, in, in the herb uh, signaling. Um, and uh, and this is um, this is the uh, rather unfortunate outcome that what you can see is that there is no clear qualifying biomarker that passed the system. Um, what we had was a whole bunch of things that may be of interest. So we were stopped short simply because we 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 lacked the numbers. And this was just recently published. Um, where we had um, 55 patients with uh, triple negative breast cancer, uh, did uh, a cancer mini genome, 2,000 genes uh, that we sequenced. Uh, these patients all received uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy. We had responders and non-responders, um, and, and we could identify it. You can see in these triple negative community that the P53 mutated gene was the, the most uh, ominous gene that was there, uh, but there was as expected, a whole bunch of other genes that were also involved in, in these triple negative cancers. And again, um, just published uh, two weeks ago, what we see is that the mutation rates were similar, no recurrent mutations were associated, again, low numbers, um, but we had some interesting signs that 3A mutations were exclusively observed in patients proficient for BRCA1. Um, and some samples had a higher copper number alteration rate and, and were associated with poor chemo out, uh, response. Very interesting, but they should be considered as exploratory. And I would say in 2015, I would not start another trial with just such limited numbers. And then it comes back to the first slide. We cannot do that as a single institution. You need to have the numbers and bring that data together. It's also very difficult to approach it as a clinical trial, because as a clinical trial, you need to have this whole organization, and then you enter one or two patients with that particular profile. So we need to have it from a kind of a concerted effort to bring all the data together. Um, so uh, a little bit about data quality. It's, it's very important, and I'll, I'll come back to that in explaining how we organize it in the Netherlands. Data quality is very important, and that's not only data quality in the sense that you have the data, but performing the biopsy, making sure that there's sufficient percentage of tumor cells in there, that you have a high quality of DNA, RNA analysis, that you isolate it properly, you store it properly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That quality is also uh, very important. Um, and then when we started off uh, organizing it in the Netherlands, um, obviously there, there are a number of components outside data sharing that are also very important. I'll try to address them in, in the rest of my talk. Uh, we have ethical issues, biobanking, 
we need to teach patients and, and uh, clinicians big data, but then we have here the genome interpretation, large scale sequencing, what do you want to sequence, standardization of the clinical data, uh, but also returning uh, genetic information to patients, all things that you would never have dreamed of when we started this project, but need to be taken into account. So we started in 2010 um, with, with organizing it in the Netherlands. Um, and what you can see here is that we're not alone. Uh, December 2012, Genomics England has, has launched this initiative to sequence 100,000 genomes. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, that now finally has, uh, has started to make some, some ground way with the first patient in, if I'm informed correctly, uh, March 2015. So it's been a while since the first patients were entered here. But again, um, very important that you have support of the government. And obviously, in January 2015, um, Obama has announced a, a similar investment, but a slightly smaller, I would say, 250 million investment to kind of look for precision medicine and uh, try to improve that. So when we are uh, looking at these initiatives, then first of all, you want to kind of get a feeling how broad this, this is implemented in, in the world. Um, so we looked at, at, at initiatives worldwide, and this is a um, work that Daniel Fiss uh, here in the Institute has done uh, as part of a survey that we send out to a lot of initiatives around the world. So a couple of hundreds, and, and we said, okay, if you have an initiative where you not do single institution data collection, but you're actually having a network where you're part of it, let us know how you work with your data, how you create your data, how do you store it, how, do you, how did you organize the system. And um, these are the, the places where we got um, answers from back. And, and again, this was a, a true attempt to reach out to about everyone. Um, it also tells you that there is a little bit of worry about how the, 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 the rich countries, I would say, are, are uh, leading the way. Europe, the US, Australia, Singapore, Japan, one side, one place in, in South America. But you can see that there is a, a, a huge of underrepresentation. And we need to kind of realize how we can fit that in and how we can make sure that this knowledge also reaches those communities. Um, this is a, a, a part of a global alliance for genomic health. Uh, you've probably heard of this um, uh, initiative. Uh, there are many initiatives to kind of bring all the data together. Uh, and they all have the same ideas in the sense that you want to have cross-institute information data sharing, you want to bring the precision medicine clinical trials and, and screening platforms and big data, bring it to the cloud and, and have all these working groups, uh, which is all very important um, to get that organized, but also extremely challenging. So then back to the Netherlands, we started in 2010 and said, we cannot do this alone, let's start being um, collaborative and create a network. Um, we start by the uh, three founding centers, the NKI, Utrecht, and Rotterdam, but now 2014, all UMCs are, uh, so university medical centers in the Netherlands participate, that's an initial eight, and we're expanding to the, uh, the top teaching hospitals, there are, those are 28, and uh, we'll switch gears and hopefully in the end of 2016, all hospitals in the Netherlands are connected. And these are the, the, the logos of the centers that are already participating. That means that we will have a network of um, hospitals that will have doctors that will be able to facilitate biopsies of their patients. And those biopsies will go to a central facility to ensure quality control, make sure that we have one system that we can use and um, bring those clinical data also in a structured way into this central database. Because in the end, uh, obviously, we want to have, have this system. So the Center for Personalized Cancer Treatment is the name of this collaborative effort. We have a protocol for um, be, being able to biopsy all patients. So patients undergo a biopsy, image guided to ensure high quality. Um, then the pathology looks at it, it looks at the number of tumor cells, the DNA and RNA, and protein is isolated in a, in a single protocol. And then we generate as much data out of that as humanly possible. And in the end, hopefully, um, 
we can also kind of look whether we have, for instance, organoids that we grow living tumors from individual patients, expose them ex vivo, and then create uh, data um, which we can feed into the system again. This is uh, our vision, and this is actually how we're, how we're working. Um, and in the past few years, we realized that this was going to be a bigger and bigger initiative uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, so this is, in, in McKinsey terms, who we are very fortunate to have them on board a couple of times over the past uh, years, uh, the, the value chain. So we need to include patients, we need to include the clinical data, we need to take the biopsy, then we need to have this part, pre-processing the biopsy, sequencing, managing the sequence uh, and the clinical data in the database. <laughs> and then we need to analyze and do the clinical trials and biobanking. This is the chain that we had organized, and then we said, well, if this is going to be something that we're going to do for all hospitals in the Netherlands, we need to be professional, and the dark blue ones, we said, okay, that is an overseeable entity, let's take that out and create a separate facility for that, and it's now <coughs> called the Hartleaf Medical Foundation, which is a centralized facility um, in a foundation setup, so it's everyone's um, database. The Hartwig Medical Foundation does not do research itself. It just creates the database containing the genomic and the clinical data. And if you have a great idea, you can tap into that particular database. There's a whole genome sequencing data. We have an Illumina X10 setup, which is uh, there are very few non-commercial places in the world that have that setup, so that's working. Um, and, and it um, and we're able to function in, at least in the, in the next two, three years to, to be able to create this database with more than uh, 7,000 patients. This is what we do. Um, patient data, treatment response, pathology lab, DNA sequences, everything integrated, and then it, it, it comes either out as a patient report back to the specialist, uh, to the patient, but it also will serve as a platform for biomarker discovery. Uh, obviously, you have seen these kind of graphs many times because uh, uh, th this is this is the general idea. So we recently had a visit of our minister of health. Um, and you can see she's smiling here, which is um, a rare event because in the Netherlands we need to spend 300 million more simply on expensive medication because of the introduction of immune therapy. And that is a lot of money, and there will be more expenses coming. So um, she talked to us about how we can organize this and how we can generate more information on biomarkers um, uh, from, from these type of approaches. And the reason she was there was because she liked the concept of personalized medicine, but I think importantly also um, she feels that it can save money. And, and this is uh, another analysis that, that has been performed by simply reducing the adverse effect, um, inducing, uh, reducing the non-responder drug spent. If you combine that for a number of drugs only in the US for three drugs alone, it will save you about two, million, two billion per year. Uh, so there is a great opportunity, but there is only an opportunity if we change the way we do our business now. If we maintain the way we do it now by doing scattered and having scattered information, we're not going to be where we want to be. So this is an important uh, issue. Because in the end, I would say, our, our minister would, would say that we need to kind of be uh, a value-based healthcare system. So it's not bad to spend money on someone, on a patient, uh, but it, it's more important to show that it actually adds value. Uh, in the sense that, that it's worth spending that much money on a patient. So measure outcome and cost for every patient is going to be very important, and we're not doing that. Uh, we need to build an enabling platform uh, and a technology platform for doing that. And in the Netherlands, we're the fact that we're small, we're in a small country, uh, we're highly organized, so we already have registries, we already have systems that collect number of data, so I think in the Netherlands we're in a very nice position to be able to bring all these uh, registries together. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether this slide is very important to you because this is your daily life, I would say challenges in data sharing, so th these are the problems that we face and you face as well, different hospital electronic health systems, um, 
cancer ontologies that we're trying to uh, align. Um, bioinformatics, the problem with that is, is still numerous. If you look at three different pipelines and you, you have not an overlap of 100%, I can tell you that's very concerning. Um, what is an actionable mutation? Um, there are many definitions are used. Safe space, legislation, privacy, all types of issues uh, that are um, that are important. And I just want to zoom in on, on the ethical challenges um, because those are the ones that may not be the ones that you think about on a daily basis. Uh, what I strongly feel is that we're reaching the limit of an informed consent procedure. We're asking to sign our patients to participate in research. We uh, tell them this is the information you get, would you participate in research and then we find biomarkers and they say sure and they sign. But the fact that we're now doing whole genome sequencing that has also an impact potentially on their germline uh, status, um, uh, their children, their family, um, they are not informed enough to be able to sign that informed consent. So we're, we're absolutely reaching the boundaries of, an, of the current informed consent. We need to wait, find a way. Uh, what to do with the withdrawn consent? If you have a data set and, and your sample is in there and you've analyzed that, should you be able to withdraw that and what does it mean for your data set? What do patients want to know and when? Also very important. Um, there are interesting studies that if you would ask a patient to participate in clinical research, over 80% says, sure, absolutely, I want to do that. If you then start informing these patients, it, it bounces back to about 50-50 because they know also the complexity of, of the information that you're generating. Um, we've done focus group interviews with patients to find that out. Um, and, and obviously, the most important thing, how do you know what you don't know? That, that is an extremely difficult question. Then more in depth, uh, how do you establish custodianship of data? Um, who's liable if something illegal is done? There are now uh, a few test cases in the courts that are demonstrating that, that we may run into problem there. Uh, which law applies? Um, how can these data and how long can these data be stored? Is that indefinitely? And this is, brings us back to a fundamental question, whether we balance the fundamental rights of individuals on privacy versus their right on having access to the newest scientific opportunities. Are we going to slow down to make sure that every individual has a a fundamental right of privacy, or are we saying, well, if, if Google knows everything about me, so why should we slow down uh, science? And, and um, frankly, there, there are many things you can say about this. Um, legal issues, we're now collaborating with a project called AGR, uh, ACR Genie, where we try to share data across the, the ocean, but also within Europe collect uh, information on tumors and uh, bring together the clinical data. Um, but you can see that there are numerous limitations that you may have. Um, German funded genomes, it is a, by itself in English a very interesting expression, German funded genomes, uh, cannot be redistributed <coughs> via commercial clouds. That, that is an issue. That means that it's very difficult to have information from German data sets. Um, NIH-funded genomes cannot be redistributed via academic or commercial compute cloud. So there are all issues we need to resolve, and, and, and I think we need to be able to join forces in that, um, in that area. Then quickly, uh, um, some notes about um, patient involvement. Uh, I think it's, it's going to be crucial for all the things that we're trying to establish here. What you're trying to do, what we're trying to do, is that we have the patients involved because they will be our leverage if we're talking to governments, if we're talking to other uh, systems. So what we've done is to do, uh, truly do that. So we had pa cancer patients from various societal dimensions, uh, politics, sports, uh, pharma, um, uh, banking, um, uh, all patients. They're now uh, creating a, a group of 50 storytellers. And, and I like the idea of not being called a patient advocate, but a storyteller, because they said our story is that we would like to have our data sequence, we would like to have our clinical data brought into the central database, not necessarily because it may help me. If there is a chance, that would be really nice, but, but we want to build something that the next generation can benefit from. And I, I think that is very appealing as a message, because it kind of takes away 
all the uh, hype on that we can now, if you do your DNA, that you know everything. <laughs> I have patients coming in with my outpatient clinic and say, here, this is my USB stick, my genome isn't there, tell me what I need to do. Um, there's no way we can do that uh, in, in this day of age. Um, yeah, that's more or less. So um, what we try to do is get these patients involved uh, in, in um, being truly a part of it. And it also means that we need to educate them. So we need to kind of have patients understand what it means to do your DNA sequencing. So we have patients here explaining things to the whole group of patients. We have uh, tours through our uh, sequencing facility where we have the setup and just make sure that they become aware with, with that particular knowledge um, that we're trying to, to bring across. And by itself, that is, um, that is a, a huge challenge. But we also need to make sure that we educate the doctors. Because there is a concern that the doctors are not um, moving forward fast enough. Uh, I would consider myself to be an extremely young oncologist, but there are some older oncologists that still have a, a threshold before they take a biopsy because they say, well, what does it help the patient now? And if you take a biopsy and, and collect that information, let's, let's leave it. Um, and I think patients want to have that particular input. They want to be part of it. They want to uh, help to create a database. So I, I need to kind of, we need to kind of educate um, oncologists also about the background of DNA, what it can do, what it cannot do, and, and have those patients say to their oncologist, I want to be part of this particular system. So this is uh, actually an educational program that, that is initiated uh, in the Netherlands. Then um, um, if this probably not the most interesting part of the talk, uh, Center for Personalized Cancer Treatment works to closely together with the Hartwig and obviously our, our mission is to provide more effective cancer treatment by personalized medicine, number of drugs that we get to the market and here for the Hartwig is to create this data set uh, that can be used. Um, that is on neutral ground. Uh, it's our experience if you put it in one uh, academic center then the all other academic centers also want to have the same infrastructure because otherwise they will fell left out of the loop. So we put it on neutral territory, said this is from all of us, let's do that. This is how we're organized. A non-executive committee, executive committee, uh, so this is part of, of all academic centers. They have people in there and we have the health technology is going to be an extremely important part to, to show that we actually um, save money. We have a group on targeted treatment, phase one, the off-label program, the ethics, uh, etc. And for the um, uh, Hartwig Medical Foundation, we were very fortunate to have Robert Dijkgraaf as the um, chair uh, and an excellent scientific committee um, with a data access board that allows access to the, to the data set. And that brings me to my final slide. These are the participating center of, um, of our initiative now, and this is, uh, we have just recently four more hospitals uh, connected to the system. This is the funding, um, and one of the payers has already started investing a little bit in a project that we're trying to run. There are no names on here, because if I would show you all the people that were involved in this, then I need 10 more slides in a very small font size to uh, um, be really appreciative of all the efforts of all the people uh, that put, people have put in. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope indeed that I've spent the last 49 minutes and 48 seconds um, keep you awake and, and perhaps tell you something that you're interested in. Thank you. want to help patients and we all know brothers, sisters, friends and that that have died of these horrible diseases and we, we want to fix it so I really appreciate you sharing that you care and you're implementing this technology because we do see a lot of physicians that are, are not open-minded and um, aren't always doing what I think is best for their patients. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jay Bergeron from Pfizer. I, I also um, am 
uh, the scientific coordinator of the Etrix, which is very similar to Trey um, in the part of the IMI program. And one of the things that we're trying to do in Etrix in the last two years is to develop a patient input plan. And it's something that we hadn't planned on at the beginning of the of the consortium, but something we thought we were well placed to potentially be able to do. What are your recommendations for initial outreach to patient forums in terms of getting interest and getting uh, and, and driving some communication with with patient forums as well as do you think there's a difference between outreach to patients in the oncology arena versus other other indications? Yeah, that's, uh, that's um, a good question and I'm afraid I don't have a simple answer um, because cancer is, is, is a totally different area than cardiovascular diseases and, and there are different emotions attached to that. Um, uh, I would say for us it was very important to connect with the patient community and also be very selective because what you can see is that an, a lot of people uh, who are touched by cancer have their story and they have their own perspective on things and they want to share that particular story rather than looking at the focused approach we're trying to build the database we're trying to do data sharing we try to kind of have DNA RNA sequencing in, in the middle of that so that means that you need to have a, a, a very strict communication set of skills uh, so we're, we're very selective and we allow the patients to select people that fit with their program so a, a, a general outreach to the patient community you need to kind of make sure that you have a, um, a good understanding of who you're going to connect because if you're not connecting with the right people it, it may also have some adverse effects I would say in communication um, but you can start at least by, by having the obvious patient efficacy groups we, we kind of stayed away from that we, we selected pure patients that were interested from the start um, and, and they said, okay, let's do this, and then they created their own force, and that is now as a kind of rapidly expanding through the country. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hinko Gierman from Illumina. That was great. Thank you so much. I had a question. It's, I think, very obvious how a tool like Transmart plays a pivotal role in distributing the data for researching all of um, the trials. My question is, could you comment a little bit about how a tool like Transmart or any other software for the matter could play a role in helping, for example, the Molecular Tumor Board decide on those cases where you don't have a clear actionable variant? Yeah, so I would say that the, uh, um, the knowledge library in whatever form or shape is, is extremely important and uh, there are a number of ways to get to a knowledge library. NextBio is an example. I think they're representative of NextBio here as well. Um, so that, that those type of approaches would, would, would help. And what you see now is that every large self-respectable institution is having a couple of PhD students collect the information and then say, okay, this is, this is uh, how we can be as smart as possible. I, I don't think that that is the way to move forward. We need to kind of bring that together, but it needs to be accessible, uh, preferably very clear-cut uh, conditions, um, and uh, we need to move forward fast. So what we see is that um, if, if, you do, if you do work as a commercial entity, it is more difficult to kind of get attached to these type of systems that we are running in the Netherlands than if you're a more of an open source type of thing. So we're struggling with that. Uh, we, we know that we need to have the knowledge library. We know to what type of information should be in there, how it should be curated, and, and what the knowledge library can be used for uh, by the, the tumor boards. But we're not there yet. Um, so I realize that's an extremely vague answer. Uh, but we need them, and, and we're not there yet having a, a very good system for that. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry. Yeah, I have a question about the global perspective, because you also men, uh, mentioned the Global Alliance. This is a Dutch project. Um, the mutations that you find, are they specific to the Dutch population or is this very much applicable to the global context? And the other question is, um, if you look to African genomes and uh, Asian genomes, those have more variability. So um, do you also need those genomes maybe sequenced in order to you know, find the answers? Yeah, 
Yeah, so I, I like the question very much and, and uh, I alluded a little bit on the slide that I showed you that there was no sequencing initiative, at least for cancer in, in Africa, but also in parts of Asia. Um, I think it's not a, 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 it's not a new information that different genomes respond differently to, to drugs um, and, and there, there is a selection bias and stuff like that. I think the data will be extremely more valuable if we have also that background taken into account because the people are migrating and, and we need to kind of have that information as well. So it would be great to have those communities attached to the system as well. But for now, it, it still is extremely expensive to do this, to organize it. Um, and when we talk to people in, in South America or in, in Africa, I mean, to be honest, some, some areas have even difficulty in providing morphine to their patients and, and they're saying, well, very nice that you have a DNA sequencing equipment, but this is not our priority. And, and it makes sense. But you're losing that particular information that may be very valuable uh, to other interpretations. So, yes, but I think the timing is going to be important. So I think, Emil, it's uh, really fantastic to see how you actually succeeded to organize so many institutes, medical doctors, scientists, collaborating on this project. And I think for the Transmart community, this really means that uh, we need to be able to accommodate these kind of studies. So I think uh, during this meeting, we have more work to do. Emil, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. So it's uh, time for lunch. During lunch, there will be the training session. And so for the people going to the training session, please be a